thought that maybe that one of the guests was trapped. It was not a human being. Who's there? That startled me pretty bad. I don't see anyone. There was this smell. <laughs> I believe in the spirits and without a question. What do you need from Jump. me? It goes right into your soul. I was looking at pure evil. What you are about to watch is based on true events. Some details have been altered to protect confidentiality. My name is Sam, and I work the night shift. Salem, with its storied past of witch hunts, is home to the old hotel that Sam works at. As a night auditor, you work a shift generally from 11 p.m. until 7 a.m. I have been fascinated with the witch trials history of Salem for years. In 1692, on the very ground where Sam now works, over 200 citizens were accused of practicing witchcraft. 20 were put to death. Working in the quiet on the night shift allows Sam to study the history of the witch trials for his book. It was a perfect job for me because it was kind of a slower job and I was able to write while I was working. My first week at the hotel started off fairly non-eventful. And then suddenly... That night, the old hotel is creaking with unfamiliar sounds. I heard what sounded like banging on the inside of the elevator. So I thought maybe that one of the guests was trapped. I noticed that the elevator was in the basement area of the hotel, which was odd because there was nobody there to be in the basement, and you needed a special code to go down there. So I pushed the button to the first floor for the lobby, and it, it comes up. And then the elevator opens up. I look in, and there was nothing in the elevator. The elevator is empty, but someone or something is in the hotel basement. I was terrified. Sam has never ventured to the underbelly of the old hotel. I see what looks like lights that were leading me to the back wall of the basement. Hello? looked like there were footprints, but the footprints were huge footprints. There were not my footprints on the ground.
like it was leading me to the back of the basement of this hotel. He's led to a dead end. It looked like something was filled in in the tunnel beneath the area of the hotel. There is something unusual about the brick wall. The tunnel was bricked in, so I was not able to go inside. It made it even more creepy. Then I heard what sounded like the moan that I heard before. Sam feels a presence behind the wall. I was terrified. I started suspecting that there may be something paranormal going on, something that was not explainable. I was terrified. I felt helpless. I felt like that I was in a place where I couldn't get out because I was working. And I felt like my workspace was being invaded. What made you stay? What made me stay at the hotel was the fact that I was working on a book on Salem's history. We had very few people to work the hotel, especially working overnight. So I was determined to stick it out, even though things were getting progressively scarier for me. On Sam's night shift at a hotel in Salem, rumored to be haunted, he finds himself face to face with something he can't explain. I looked up and I saw what looked like a shadow coming from the back of the hotel. There was not much of a shape to it. It was just a black mass of energy, like it was trying to form into something. And it was feeding off the energy of the hotel. The black mist came over, and then to make things even more scary, there was nobody there. Nothing human. presence is still with him. There's a helplessness there. Like, I can't leave, I can't call anybody. It's three in the morning. Do I call the cops? Are they gonna think I'm crazy? kind of building and building, and he, whatever it was was sort of revealing itself to me. It looked like a man wearing an old school hat. <laughs> Seeing those red eyes, I knew whatever it was, it was not a human being. I was looking at pure evil, and it was looking back at me. I have never been that terrified in my life. When the spirit manifests in front of Sam, it has glowing red eyes. And in my experience, that is not a human spirit he's dealing with. 
He's dealing with something non-human, and he would do well to watch his back. seizes the moment to escape the entity. I had to get out. Sam, you seem very upset with the telling of your story. What's happening? I'm super emotional about this experience because I felt like going back and kind of feeling the emotion of what it was like seeing this figure in the window haunts my dreams. Sam quit his job. He's safely home in Boston. But the attachment to the entity was not over. I had no idea what that shadow figure was and what it wanted from me. Sam uncovers horrifying facts. It turns out that my family is related to the Putnam family. My cousin Ann Putnam Jr. accused 62 people and 19 of them were hanged for witchcraft. The entity could be a victim of Sam's distant cousin, one of the accusers. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking realizing that I am descended from the bad guys. Sam has a very personal, familial connection to the Salem witch trials. And it's no coincidence that he has been singled out we are talking about innocent men and women who were put to death in the most awful ways, crushed by rocks, hanged, all for something they weren't guilty of. Imagine the resentment, imagine the anger, imagine the simmering rage. He's been targeted by an entity. Now knowing that he may be in danger, Sam searches for a way to protect himself. In his ancestors' documents, Sam comes upon an apology written by Ann Putnam Jr. for the harm she caused. Uh, I thought if I would say this apology, that maybe it would give them some kind of peace and they would possibly leave me alone. He returns to the hotel to deliver the apology. That I, by such providence of God, be made an instrument for the accusing of several persons of a grievous crime, whereby their lives were taken away from them, whom now I have just grounds and good reason to believe they were innocent persons. I'm sorry. I am truly sorry. I'm truly sorry. I'm sorry. Truly sorry. When I read that out loud, I felt like it was a cleansing of some sort. I felt like that I was giving Ann Putnam Jr. the chance to say the words out loud through me. Maybe now, the angry entity will leave him alone. When I found out that, that I was related to Ann Putnam Jr., I decided that it was my passion, my role in life, to give a voice to those without a voice. And I wanted to get to know the victims as much as I can through research, uh, through history. Now that I've experienced what I have firsthand working at the hotel in Salem, I believe in the spirits without a question. My name is Riley and I work the night shift. As midnight approaches, Riley makes her way to her very first job as an overnight office cleaner. At 16, I had this job because I was starting to get into trouble. I was staying out all hours of the night. I wasn't, you know, listening to what my mother wanted me to do. I just wanted to have fun. I was 16, and I was rebellious, very rebellious. Riley has been hired to help clean a building 
that's about to go up for sale. The job has been scheduled to last three nights. I wasn't thrilled, I'm not gonna lie. It's third shift. Nobody really wants to stay up until the wee hours of the morning unless you're having a party. The moment Riley arrives, she realizes something is very wrong. <coughs> when I first walked into the building, the air was very thick. It was hard to breathe. It was stale. It, it was like nobody was in there for a very long time. Adding to Riley's apprehension are the stories she's heard about the building. There was rumors around town about the things that went on in there and how nobody really liked working in that building at all. Hello? They would hear whispers. They would hear uh, footsteps. You're late. Now stop standing around and get to work. Sorry. OK. In the building that I was cleaning, there was only one other person that was working with me, this old woman. Riley sets to work on the near impossible task of cleaning the office. She soon suspects there may be someone else in the building. Did you hear that? I didn't hear anything. Hello? I had stuck my head out in the hall, look and see who was in the building at 2 o'clock in the morning, because nobody was supposed to be there. Hello? So when I looked up and down the hallway, there was no one there. They were running. The footsteps were running down the hallway. Who's there? I, I, I can hear you. Did you hear that? There's someone running out there. You have to have heard it. Just get back to work, OK? Take care of that carpet. She played it off like she didn't hear it. I told you I didn't hear anything. But I know she did. Riley returns to work, but what happens next is impossible for her and the co-worker to ignore. A few minutes later, as we're vacuuming the floors, we heard this huge door slam coming from the hallway. Did you hear that? I don't know. I went out in the hallway and I walked up and down. Hello? <laughs> if you don't show yourself, I'm gonna call security. And I didn't see anybody at all. Hello? Is anyone there? When I heard the other door slam, it startled me pretty bad. What are you doing? Get back to no, work! No, look.
overnight office cleaner, Riley, discovers the building where she works is home to terrifying paranormal entities. What are you doing? We were looking at each other, trying to figure out what was going on and whether if we should call somebody or if we should continue on with what we were doing. OK, come on. Let's keep going or we're not going to get paid. OK, come on. Hurry up! We only had a few more hours left in the night, so we needed to get moving. Riley's relieved when the end of her shift finally comes. When she gets home, she talks to her mom. She said not to pay it any mind and just to finish the job. It was almost over. And if I had any problems, there was a walkie-talkie that I could use that I could radio security in the other building, and they would come um, if I needed them to. Following her mother's advice, Riley returns to work the next night. I was uncomfortable going into the place because I had all these unanswered questions of what happened the night before. You can finish up in here. I'm going to start down the hall. Just get started on those shelves, OK? OK. Suddenly, I heard this cry somewhere in the building. Please, hurry. Hello? Ah! Are you OK? I, I never forget that woman and the way that she had cried out. It just scared the hell out of me. It, it, it goes right through you. It goes right into your soul. Are, are, are you OK? Is anybody in there? So I had uh, walked over there to see who it was who needed help. The cries seemed to be coming from the kitchen. Is that smoke? I was looking up at the vents to see if the smoke was coming out of there. But I, I couldn't see anything. And I didn't know if the building was on fire or, or what was going on. And I knew that we needed to get out of there. Louisa, there's a fire! It smells like smoke. Yeah. OK, uh, we have to call security. Where's the walkie-talkie? I don't know, I don't know. Oh, there it is, there it is. Good. And as we were trying to radio for security. Oh, why won't this work? Hello? OK, there. Hello, security? You know, it said it again. Run! Run! We have to go. Go! Go! The voice on the walkie talkie to me to this day, I think it was just something to try to warn us that something that is in there does not want us in there. As we ran past a side office, there's a fire, sir! I saw a janitor standing in there cleaning with his back facing me. So I stopped. Sir, we have to get out of here. There's a, there's a fire, sir. When I touched him on the sleeve and he turned around, I'll never forget that. Never in my entire life. I'll never forget the way he looked. <laughs> Half his face was burned. I looked at him right into his eyes, and his eyes were dead. I couldn't even move. I couldn't breathe. I had to look like a car accident. You can't look away, but you have to keep looking. <laughs> the relief I felt when I finally made it out of the building was, thank God I'm safe. 
whatever it was in there is not with me now. After I explained everything to my mom, what I had witnessed and what I had seen, my mother told me to pray that it was it was something that is not of this world and that, you know, it, it doesn't belong here. So I did my own research and I started going through old newspapers and I found out that there was a fire um, back in the 1950s that killed five people, um, one janitor, uh, two men, and two women. The janitor was one of the, it was the man who died in the fire in 1950. A lot of energy was expended during a very tragic event and Riley comes in and picks up these energies. These spirits need Riley to acknowledge the trauma they suffered before death from some accident that if could have been prevented. They might also be trying to, to warn her, you know, in case uh, she's in danger herself. I do feel for these people. I really do. It broke my heart to, to, to see and to know that these people were still stuck in this building. This building is still for sale to this day. What I've learned from that event is that if they want to show you how they died, they will show you how they died. My name is John, and I work the night shift. After graduation, I had went back to my hometown to stay with my mother. I really didn't want to be a burden on her. I needed a job. A friend of mine, he says, um, you're in luck. He says that we had a guy just quit a few days ago. It's an unusual job, but John needs the money to pay off loans and to help out at home. Let's go, John. We got a call. Yeah. John and his partner are called to the site of a tragic drowning. I took a job for uh, recovery and transport of uh, deceased individuals. This was my fourth night on the job. We had a call to go out to uh, a drowning. We would pick up the body and uh, transfer it to the uh, coroner's facility. He had his accident at the river. He was intoxicated at the time that this happened. The guy originally weighed 180 pounds. When he was retrieved, his body weight had almost tripled. The water had soaked into him, and his body was bloated with liquids. So he was pretty heavy. There was this smell. Oh, God, that's disgusting. What a nightmare. Ugh. Oh, my God, give me that skeleton through the mask. Yeah. I mean, like, the godliest, deathliest smell that I've, I've never smelled anything like that in my life. That isn't the only thing they have to worry about. That doesn't look good. Looks like the bridge is out. Now what? So, so what do we do? We don't have much of a choice. We've got to go back to the office. Weather forces them to break protocol and bring the corpse to their office rather than to the coroner. As they unload the vehicle, they get a nasty surprise. All this liquid starts coming out of the, out of the van. Uh, and he says, oh, man, I can't believe this just happened. His abdomen exploded. That's where that's, all that's coming from, his stomach area. Got it. What are we going to do, leave him in the van? And he says, no, we have to take him into the office. Regulations state, as long as we have custody of him, we cannot be no more than 50 feet from him. I was thinking, like, where are we going to put this guy? You know, because he's leaking these fluids still. Where are we going? Out of the end there. That room's got a drain in it. And my partner says, well, he says, there's only one place that we're going to be able to put him, and there is a janitor's utility closet. Great, there's a drain over there. This will work, all right? It's going to have to sit him up and let him drain, because we can't put him anywhere else. One, one two, two, three. three. Stop! Let's get turned, turn, turn. It took us a minute, but we got him off uh, the gurney. We set him up, uh, made sure he was secure, that he wasn't going to fall. Where do you want this? When um, we shut the door, we had to get these towels to put down on the bottom of the door so they keep some of that smell from coming out. Ugh. We were in a stress mode at that time. 
call their supervisor to find out what to do next. Can we go? No, nope, we're going to be stuck here for a while. Rules and regs. With no idea when the bridge might reopen, John and his partner have no choice but to stay put. The way that it was going outside, we had a feeling that was going to happen. John hears something move in the hallway. He notices the gurney isn't where they left it. This was kind of strange to me. He shrugs it off and locks it back in place. The onset of a haunting, you can often see small acts, the kind of things that you may not notice at first, and they are the onset of bigger things to come. Minutes later, as John heads back to the break room, he's rattled. No way, no way, no way. The gurney from the other side of that room hallway is now in the reception area. That was the freakiest thing. Those wheels were locked on that gurney. Hey, hey Tim, Tim! Both those wheels had to come unlocked. How did that do that? How does that happen? Tim! I was definitely feeling that anxiety at that time. I was getting anxiety. This is where it started to get strange. That smell hit me again. Whoa. The smell from the body? Yeah, from the, just, just hit me all, all at once. And as I took a few steps, I noticed these two towels that we had laid in front of the door were moved out into the hallway like something went over and moved them. We were the only ones there. You know, who else moved them? That's what got me thinking, you know, there's got, there's got to be something else going on, something of you know, the supernatural type of thing going on. It gets stranger still. I notice the door is cracked open about six inches. Now, I know this door was locked. And so I kind of like walked up to it, trying to see what was going on. John makes a terrifying discovery. <gasps> While stuck in his office overnight with a dead body, John experiences some unexplained activity and the door he locked that contained the corpse is now somehow opened. When I looked into the door, I could not believe what I just saw. Get out here, get out here! The bag that this guy was in was unzipped down below his chin. Jeez! His head was out of the bag and he was looking straight at the wall. His eyes were closed when we put him in there. Now they're open. We didn't leave him like that. No, we did not. Right? What were you thinking? You know, a, a surreal type of thing, you know, it's just like a dream or somewhere you just don't want to be in this bad nightmare. We closed the door, right? Of course we did. These zippers are pretty thick and heavy. You just can't unzip them that easily. How, how did that happen? I've never been more afraid. Once we die, not everybody moves on automatically. Some spirits find themselves earthbound for a certain period of time. What do we do? 
Well, we're gonna zip them back up and check that bridge and see if we can get the hell out of here. Zip them up, yeah. <coughs> we re the bag back up and we shut the door. John's discovery of the bag zipper being pulled down to expose the cadaver's face is a troubling one. What John's dealing with is an intelligent haunting. It's interactive and not in a very nice way. John wants to leave, but knows if he does, he loses his job and more. Chief said that's a, actually a criminal offense if we leave that body there. before they have a chance to regroup. We kind of like jumped. You know, what is this next thing gonna be? Now you hear this knocking on the front door. A knock, just a steady knock on the front door. Who is it? I don't see anyone. I, I. I don't see anyone. All right. I, I got to go around and take a look. My partner said, I'm going to go out around front and see who it is. And you just wait right here. I'm right back. And he says, is there someone knocking on the door? Because I don't hear it on this end. And I said, yeah, I can, I can hear it on this end, but no one's there. A big chill comes through you, you know, when your hair starts standing up on your, on your arms, you get the goosebumps type of feeling. That's the kind of feeling that I got. Scream, but I can plainly hear it saying, let me out. And I turned my head like that, nothing there, but I know I just heard that. Whew. John is being haunted by the spirit of the dead man who appears to be undead. That guy, when that door was open earlier, I think he came out. He's trying to get our attention. I wanted to be out of that building. I wanted to be back home. But you can't leave that body there. You know, I mean, that's, that's a felony. This has got to end. I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. So I got angry at that point. I got mad. And so the door that was down in the hallway, I ran down there and I shoved it open. is showing his face again. But something has changed. When I looked at his face, uh, his eyes are open. You can see like tears coming down his face. And that was very, very strange. This guy was somehow still attached to his body. Uh, I was very upset about it. I can help the living, but I don't want to help the dead. Leave me alone! John? What do you need from John. me? John! Leave me alone! John! Leave John. me alone! John! John! No, 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 buddy. Calm down. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. You leave me alone! I told this guy or whatever was in here, I said, you want to leave? Now leave. You don't belong here anyway. John's plea is answered when help finally arrives. The medical examiner's office was able to come across the bridge. They came out to uh, retrieve uh, the deceased person that was in the uh, uh, room there. It was a big relief when 
he was out of the building. I mean, I felt this, oh man, like you can breathe again type of type of thing. We we're, were just happy that it, this is all now over um, and it's time to go home. As John heads home, he tries to shake off the night, but he can't. This guy's standing right there, right in front of me. Whoa, was, oh my God, I couldn't breathe. It was only like three or four seconds. I didn't know if I was seeing something or if it was actually him, but solid figure, just like he was sitting in that room. Do you believe this was paranormal? Yes. This was just one of the most remarkable things that has happened to me. In order to understand it, you have to experience it. 